How's everybody doing this morning? Ought to be good. I mean, you've had Thanksgiving. You know how it is. Ate a lot of turkey, laid around. Got, uh, no, I'm not going to say what I was thinking there. But then, I mean, the Hokies won, the Mountaineers won. I mean, it's been a good week, you know. And um, here we are getting ready to roll into Christmas season. So it's a great time of the year. Uh, but, you know, it's always a great time of the year when you're serving God. Amen? Yeah. Amen? But Gloria and I are just thrilled to be back with you folks and always love coming to Voice of Praise and uh, appreciate so much Pastor uh, N.R. Uh, inviting us and uh, being uh, able to be here. And we uh, hope that him and Sarah have a restful uh, time away. And uh, I don't know about that cheese ball thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I I hope it's not like the time I made that mountain man breakfast when I was camping. Rick would appreciate this. I made a mountain man breakfast in a new Dutch oven, and, and uh, I noticed the kids wasn't eating it. I thought, hmm, I better try that. So I tried it, and I saw why they wasn't eating it. Uh, the something the sausage or something in there was bad. I mean bad. And so I put it over in the grease pit, and the uh, old dog come along, and the dog... He ate it, but then he got sick, and he got sick. Let me just say he got sick, you know? And uh, the, them boys never let me forget that. But it's good to see Rick here, too. We've worked a lot together with uh, rangers and uh, at the campgrounds and in missions. Him and Trish do a great job with the missions. Uh, I was looking at all the displays coming in, and uh, it's, it's great to be in a seven-star missions church today. You, the, this house knows how to celebrate missions and, and giving and getting the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. And on behalf of all our missionaries and our nationals in over 100 countries at IPHC uh, Missionary Presence, let me just say thank you uh, for what you've done for the Lord and what you're doing for the Lord. Uh, in fact, I'm, I just want to celebrate this morning how that uh, you, you've just taken the top off that global offering and went beyond your goal uh, for the year. And I just, I'm excited about that. Over two, what was it, over $2,285? Uh, no, that was last year. This year, $2,451. Uh, so you re way exceeded what uh, your goal was. And that global money, let me tell you, it does a great job of ministering around the world and right here in America as well. Uh, last uh, January, Rick and I were in, uh, down there in, in South America, uh, and we were able to uh, see a church rise up out of a, a building lot in Uruguay that uh, Global Money bought that uh, initial foothold in that country. Only six, seven years old, we had ministry there in that country, and that was the very first church. And uh, see, Global Money does things like that, and uh, your giving uh, blesses others. You know, not only that, but being a seven-star church means you, you give to every every area of missions. Uh, I mean, in the faith commitment, you, last year you gave almost $10,000 to the missionaries uh, in the monthly commitment. Uh, you uh, do the people to people uh, that blesses the children. Uh, and uh, you do the uh, coffee house ministry. You do the projects. And, and I'm excited about your project next year to Honduras. I think that's going to be a great time. Uh, in fact, Gloria's out there saying, I want to go with these, do that. So uh, I don't know how many you can take over there, but I might get up a big load and go over there and work. Um, but uh, we both, both of us love missions, and uh, you know, when it's funny how things, when you're kind of raising your kids, you don't know really who you're raising, you know what I'm saying? You don't know what God has in store for them, and we, we didn't realize we were raising a missionary in our home, and our youngest son, Timothy, is an IPHC missionary in, in uh, Europe, based in Norway. And uh, it's just interesting because Timothy wanted to do, I mean, he was going to be an artist in Hawaii. And then he went to, he was going to be a businessman and uh, he had a great internship out of college, uh, his last year of college in Washington, D.C. He was all about that. But all of a sudden, God got a hold of his heart. And, and uh, he went over to Hungary for the summer with David Linda Fanning. Dave was living at that time and and man, he's been over six years now in Norway. And it's, it's just interesting how God will take your paths if you let him. And in fact, that's what I want to minister on this morning about how that God has a destiny for you. 
And that's just, a, you know, we throw around that word destiny and we, we do so in the Christian circles. But you know what that really means? Is that God has a plan for your life. In fact, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And we want to share about that a little bit this morning out of Joshua in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. Um, as you're turning there, I'll just, uh, again, pause and, and just um, thank you for missions, you know, because, again, it's going to be an exciting year coming up. Uh, we're, not only are you doing Honduras, and, and we're proud of our churches when they take on big projects, um, but the conference will be going to South Sudan. You support the McClurkins, and we're going over there to construct a church in March. Rick's going on that uh, to help us with that. Um, and we're going to do uh, medical clinics there. Uh, for the first time ever, all the, all the trips I've had opportunity to lead, we have a medical doctor that's going. I'm, I'm excited about the potential of our impact with our medical clinics in such a needy part of the world. Pray with us. Help uh, with us in that in, in March coming up. So there's a lot going on in missions, and that's a good thing. And I'm glad that you're a part of it. And uh, when I was talking about the seven stars, I told you the five things, but the seven star, just so you'll know how significant it is for this church to be a seven star church, is not only do you give in those five areas, but your total giving uh, is 10% or more of the total church budget. So it's not only saying we're going to bless in these every area of missions, but we're going to bless them big. And it's like giving another tithe. And so that's, I want you to really know what that seven star is. I appreciate your pastor. Uh, and uh, your missions director for keeping it as a focus before you. Hey, let's stand for the reading of the word in Joshua chapter 3 this morning. I'm going to read the first um, five verses of chapter 3. It says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. It says, When you See the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it. You're to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark and do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For the morrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Father, we're thankful for the Word of God. We're thankful for this opportunity to share the Word of God and receive from the Holy Spirit. God, we're just asking your will be done. You'll be glorified in this setting, in our lives, in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. You may be seated. An aid group from South Africa once wrote, David Livingston, who was the famous missionary and explorer. They wrote David Livingston, who sacrificed and gave his life for the cause of missions. But their inquiry was this. It says, have you found a good road to where you are now? If so, we want to send other men to join you. David Livingston wrote back and said, if you only have men who will come with a good road, tell them I don't need them not to come. That may sound abrupt to you and I, but I think it typifies sometimes how that we are looking for a paved road to our destiny in God. We're looking for a paved road and an easy way to go into life when I want to tell you, life has its bumps. It has its challenges, it has its hills and valleys and, and times that we feel like giving up. But I want you to know this morning that we've got the authority of Scripture that tells us that, that God is for you. He's went before you, He's preparing a place for you, and He has guaranteed that you're going to be blessed, you're going to succeed if you will trust in Him, if you will put your confidence in Him and know that God's got this. And when you look here in Joshua, it's one of those instances where uh, things were uncertain. I mean, you know, we have this tendency to read Scripture, and we, we read it through the, the eyes and the thinking of, we know how it turns out. And when we read that, 
uh, that way we don't read it with the challenges in mind that these leaders faced or either we read it with a Walt Disney perspective and we think these are some kind of superheroes that, you know, jumped out of a phone booth or something. But Joshua was a, a, a man, he was a person just like you and I where he had challenges, he had doubts, he had these insecurities and he had to put up with six million people that's complaining. I just pause right there because you've been with a lot of family this, this week and, this, you know, do you have anybody complaining much, you know? Giving thanks, how about that? Let's take the positive road. Hey, you know something funny, uh, We've got three grandkids, and, and uh, you know, if you're a grandpa, you're going to work your grandkids into a sermon, right? But we've, we've got three, and the oldest is, is five. And uh, so he's thankful for these many things. And let me tell you what made the top five, though. Joel, one of his top five to be thankful for was Elvis. Can you imagine that? I mean, that sounds like that could be N.R.'s grandson, right? You know, I, you know that. Just the disclaimer is that comes from the other side of the family, okay? <laughs> but I just thought that was that was funny. But you know, in life, we do we have these these challenges because we have this desire in our hearts that that's, that God birthed in our hearts that we do want to please Him and do His will. We we were singing uh, the Lord's prayer and about His will being done quickly. But in opposition to that comes the devil. In opposition to that sometimes just comes our, our lazy, no good flesh, man. Just to be honest with you. And so here is Joshua that has these obstacles and these challenges, but it was time for him to lead this people, the people of God, into their destiny. God wants you to also to cross into that destiny. He wants this church to arise by the power of the Holy Spirit and be all that it's intended to be to impact this region and this world that we live in. So what's necessary for that? The first thing is this. The first thing is just to realize it's time. It's time for a change. It's time for a change. It's time to take the limits off of God. It's time to come to that place where you get tired of doing the same thing the same way with the same results. Think about this, that 40 years the people of God had been going in circles. It, it was time just spent really having funerals because a whole generation had to die off. Why? Because they didn't believe. They could have crossed into the land, but they chose to believe the bad report of the spies rather than the two faith field reports that came back. And because of that, they spent having funerals. I, I did a little math, and it, you know, this is rough. This is not in the King James margin at all. Um, think about if it was based on 2 million men out of a population that they had to have 137 funerals a day for that generation to die off. So their whole focus and their whole activities of life would just be really having funerals. Wouldn't that be depressing? Wouldn't that be tough? So when Joshua heard the words set out, that was a big deal. That, 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 that God told them to set out, that there was something new that was about to happen. They were departing uh, from the routine and from the norm, that God was getting ready to do a new thing. Isn't it exciting when God does a new thing and He breathes the breath of the Holy Spirit across the dust of our lives and blows out the, the cobwebs of dissatisfaction and we again feel the stirring of the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we want to do mighty things for God. We're not content with being in the shadows. We're not content with just being satisfied with church or life as normal. But we want to grab hold of the miracles of God. That's one thing I, I appreciate about the, the ministry that Timothy's involved in. Uh, he's involved, he's an IPHC missionary and he works with Jesus Revolution. And what they do is they conduct mainly street ministry all over Europe. And one of the big things is not only do they preach the gospel, but they are very active in praying for miracles. 
And, you know, I can't begin to tell you how many miracles have happened on the streets of Europe that further show the people around them. Uh, I'm talking about instantaneous miracles. I'm talking about legs that's been uh, stretched out and, 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 and eyes that's been opened. And I, I'm talking about big league stuff. And it shows that uh, what the Word of God it validates in the minds of the unbelievers, hey, there's something to this. And I believe that what America needs today is a church that will arise again and read the red and believe for the power of God. Believe and hang on. Say, God, this is the promises of God. I'm going to believe them. They're yes and amen in Jesus' name. And let's believe it. Let's pray. And let's grab a hold of the hem of his garment. That will be what will change our nation. That will be what will impact our families. So in verse 4, this is a big deal. It's time for a change. Since you've never been this way before is what the, the scripture says. And so they had to keep going beyond that unbelief and fear that had kept them in circles. And so there was a three-day transition that God told them to take. And in those three days, I believe what happened was this, is that God assured him that he is the Alpha, that he's the, the God who's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the God of yesterday and all his failures. He's the God of today that will move them past the, the barriers before them. And he's the God that will take care of them tomorrow. I believe that those three days was a, a reinforcement of their faith as they begin to consecrate themselves before God. And they begin to move out with a certainty that it was time for them now to take hold of their destiny. It was time to enact the plan of God. And that's the second thing that has to be done. When you realize in your life it's time for a change, then you have to take action. You see, some people never get to that first step. They, think, they always think tomorrow I'll do something for God. Tomorrow I'll really make that commitment. Tomorrow I'll, I'll really step out. Or they get to that first base and say, you know, I'm going to change. But you've got to back that up and say, now's the time I'm going to serve God. I am going to pray in the, the Spirit and build up uh, my most uh, my holy man, the inside, like Jude says, on the most holy faith. And so number two is it's time to cross over. And that reminds us that newness is waiting in that next step. Because this is what will happen. When you decide and you step out with God, God meets you at that point. A lot of times we're, we're back waiting for God to meet us and we haven't moved and we haven't done anything to in indicate that faith has risen in our hearts. But faith moves us. Faith rises and it causes us then to connect with God in a divine, supernatural way that the power of God is released. And that's what happened is they decided it was time. And now what was, what was the big deal here? They had a physical barrier before them. They had to move over two million people over that swollen river. Some say six million with all the kids but, you know, we don't think about that again because in our day, uh, I don't know how many bridges I cross. You know, I didn't even pay attention. But think about if I left my house this morning and there were no bridges coming up here. Well, that's a big deal. I mean, you know. But think about it with the, you got children and old people and you got all your stuff. And, you, you know, so it was a big deal. They had to, it was a barrier between the destiny, where they were, and they had to get through it. They had to go over that. There, and this is, this is the way I liken it. You know, I like to bring Scripture down to where we are. I think it's like this. I believe that there are barriers, and this is the language we've, we've told God. There are certain things we've told God we wouldn't do. Or maybe you've never spoken, but it's in the back of your mind. There, there's those barriers. Say, God, I'll do anything but... <laughs> Is that right? And I can only say that because, hey, I've been there. You know? And so those are the things that I'm talking about. That God's plan is here. His destiny is here. The blessings are here. But there's that barrier. There's that, that fear. There's that doubt. There's that liability. There's that 
false voice, the enemy that's spoken to us for years that says, you're nobody, you can't do nothing. You, you, you know what I'm saying? That's the type of barriers that, 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 that keeps us back that God says it's time to cross over. It's time to go over that which is holding you back. To cross over. And the, the thing that we find that will move us beyond and move you beyond those type of barriers are three things. So this would be under the time to cross over. It's, it's this. Number one is you've got to keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Now I adapted this in the New Testament eyes looking into the Old Testament because the Word of God says in verse 3, it says when you see the Ark of the Covenant. We realize that the Ark of the Covenant to the Israelites, it represented the, the, the very presence of God. It represented that God was with them. He was in the camp. It was his, his visible presence that was with them. Now thank God in the, in the New Testament we realize that, that when we receive Jesus Christ by faith, that he is in our hearts. That he is in our midst this morning. We've gathered together in his name. But in this sense, he says, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, they were to keep their focus, again, in our setting, on Jesus Christ. They were to keep their focus on God. But this was a major change as well. Because think about it, they were used to moving when the cloud moved. They were used to moving when the pillar of fire moved. Now, God was saying, I want you to keep your eyes on that ark right there that has the tablets of God. It's got Moses' rod, all of, all of that. When the Levites pick that up and they begin to move out, that's when you move. Years ago, Timothy and I were camp, camping, hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, down in Appalachian Trail, cuts through Giles County. And, uh, we jumped on way down below Pearsonburg, 20 some miles below Pearsonburg. And uh, we were high. It's this time of year, a little bit earlier, leaves had fallen. And uh, we found ourselves like, you heard Daniel Boone? He never gets lost. He said, I've just been mighty confused about three days. We were just mighty confused. And so we kind of went, and, and we, we were lost. Okay, I'll use those words. <clears throat> and I said, well, let's go back to the last blaze. Appalachian Trail is white blazes. So we went back to the last blaze and said, Timothy, this is the way this thing's supposed to work. You're always supposed to be able to stand at one blaze and see the next one. So we looked. <laughs> it barely it caught my eye. In between two trees was this little streak of white. The trees had grown up and were, was about to hide the blaze. I said, that's it. That's our next waypoint. And I believe that's so much like our life sometimes. That, you know, we're going along and we're following the blazes of life that God sets out for us. But then there's those times we just feel like we lose our way. And we just get lost. And we have to go back. What's the last thing that God told you to do? What's the last thing? What's that, that last place where you really sensed His presence? I heard old preacher put it like this one time. He said, in the, in the, the work of God, he said, old orders stand until you are issued. He said, you always are faithful. Do what God has told you to do. And then you move on. And I just imagine the excitement of that day when Joshua got up. The city got up early. And the instructions were about, about seeing the ark. And those three days they spent. And then the ark moved. Wow. It is exciting to go forward in God. I mean, think about it. We, we need to dust off and refurbish whatever we need to do to our heart to again... Feel the excitement of Jesus moving in our midst. When He moves, I want to move with Him, don't you? Amen. And this is what it was. They were keeping their focus on Jesus. 
They, they, they want to look at people. They want they pay attention to rumors and all of, if, if they had the news of their day. No, it was all about God. It was all about looking to the author and finisher of our salvation. That's who we're to look to. Number two in moving across those boundaries is that to live pure. The scripture says that in verse 5 that they were to consecrate themselves. And when we look at this, it means that they had those ceremonial rites of, of, of washing that had to be taken place. And the promise is if they did this, the Lord would do amazing things among them. Isn't it great when God breathes a promise to you? When He breathes that promise and, and, and faith rises in your heart. And, and I believe that as they began to consecrate their heart and cleanse themselves, they knew it was with purpose. It wasn't about uh, a forced ceremonial, outward thing. We understand sanctification is of the heart. It's not because somebody is standing over us with a club or God is standing over us with a thunderbolt. It's because we want to please God. We want to... He's our Father. And we want to delight in Him. I, I, this is what I, I can see here. That as they begin to do that, God began to do things among them. And then the third and final thing before they moved out was actually the instructions is that they were to step out. The word abar in the Hebrew is, is used 21 times in this account. And uh, it was not the same word that's used earlier in the Red Sea crossing, it's, which is interesting to me. No... This word is a stronger word. The word of bar is, is a, a word of decisive nature of no turning back. That's what it was. And, and, and whenever I say that, I can't help but not think of that song, I've decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And I believe that when they abarred, when they stepped out, that there was that same powerful passion that we've decided to go with God. We're not going back to that land. It represents our past. It represents our failures. It represents our shortcomings. But by God's help, we're going forward. By God's help, He's taking us to a new level. By God's help, we're going to lay hold of the promises for a new generation. And I believe that's what the blood of Jesus Christ does for you is when we enter into that covenant with God, we seal off the past. We say, I'm not interested in going back to the things of the world. No, I want the things of God. I see that city that's built, not made with human hands. I see that city in which God dwells that's coming down out of heaven. And we set our heart toward that. My goodness, what can compare? Because why? We have a barred. <laughs> we have stepped out. We have made a choice in God that, that we are not going back. And we're not about to change our mind. It's that type of people that God uses to build the kingdom of God. And really, it's just folks like you and I that just say, yes, God. And so the miracle is this, and this is the last point, is when they realized it was time for a change, and they took time to cross over, they decided it was time to live beyond the limits. It's not over just to cross over. But you've got to occupy the land. You've got to pull down the high walls. 
You've got to kill the giants. Because when they went into the land, all of that faced them. But they realized that they could do it because why? When they crossed over, don't skip over that miracle. When the priest went into the waters, the waters ceased and piled up and they went over dry shot, as we like to say. And that miracle of God showed them that he would be with them every step of the way. They were going to finish the job. In the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, the last event that's in all Olympics was the marathon. 26 miles and 400 meters. In the race that day, there was a runner from Tanzania. His name was John Akari. He had the distinction of being the last runner on the course. In fact, everybody had cleared out of that huge stadium just for a handful of reporters and a few people cleaning. It had taken him so long because he had gotten tangled up with another runner and he had fell and injured himself on the course. And by all rights, he could have stopped and just said, you know, I can't finish this race. But he crossed the line and he fell into the arms of his waiting coach. And immediately the reporters ganged around him and said, why did you keep going? I mean, it's obvious he was bloody and bruised. And he said something that day that I think typifies the type of attitude we're to have as well. He said, my country did not send me to Mexico City just to start the race. But they sent me here to finish it. I thought about that many times because the car he had to look beyond the pain and beyond the convenience of stopping because he realized that he didn't want to let down a whole entire nation that was watching him. I shared his name today because I don't know who finished it. I guess I could look it up. But people remember Akari's name. Even though he finished last. Because he finished despite the pain. Today, you might be stumbling today as well. And you're running the race set before you and God, but you're running with pain. You've got those barriers we've been talking about and those things that so easily beset us. But I want to tell you today that, listen, you can finish the race. You've got one who's went before you. Who, and not only that, but listen, you've got a great cloud of witnesses, the heavenly host cheering you on. And you can do it through God. I want our musicians to come back and I want just to take a moment for us to pause and, and say, God, how do you want me to receive this word? What is that you want to do in my life? I invite you just to bow your heads with me. And let's talk to him about that. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today that you finished your course and you finished your race. Overcoming every obstacle, every sin. In fact, without sin. And so today we're pausing and saying, God, we want your will to be done in the lives of this, your people. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed. What is the troubles in your heart? I wonder today if, if you have that same set of circumstances that beset the Israelites where they, they got into the rut and, and because of, of sin and, and fear and doubt they, they begin to have to circle. And life just became routine. They got up, circled around the mountain, had funerals, went to bed. They got up and day after day it was just a routine. I want you to know that God can break through your routine. 
the routine that would keep you out of your destiny and take you on a path that will take you to the next level. It could be any manner of things where you just come back to the Lord or you just need a fresh touch from God. Whatever it is, you say, you know, Pastor Larry, that's me. You just indicate that by uplifted hand so I can pray with you today. Yes, amen. God sees that point of contact. When your hand goes up, you're saying, by faith, I'm, I'm receiving that in Jesus' name. Is there someone else? Let's be honest. It's between you and God. It's, it's, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Hallelujah. God, you're a good God. I thank you for your love today. congregation I'd just like for you to stand with me as we're standing and you want a special prayer today either it's raised your hand I want you to definitely come and let's pray or if you've just got a special need perhaps you want to come and stand in for someone or you have special prayer requests this is our time this is our time that we pray for one another this is our time that we love one another that we don't go out into the world alone but we are the family of God and that we can touch God together and believe God for those dreams and for that destiny that he's planted in your heart you don't have to settle for less this is your time as they sing an invitation will you come and let's pray together